May it please the tribunal, it is my duty to present the evidence against Keitel and also against the defendant Yodel. And I would ask the tribunal for permission, if it is thought right, that those two cases should be presented together in the interest of saving time, a matter which I know we all have at heart. The story with regard to Keitel and Yodel runs on parallel lines. For the years in question, they marched down the same road together. Most of the documents affect them both, and in those circumstances, I submit it might result in a substantial saving of time if I were permitted to present the cases against both of them <coughs> together. Yes? Lord, then I shall proceed, if I may, on that basis. Lord, may I say that uh, I fully recognize that the activities of both these defendants have been referred to in detail many times, and quite recently by Colonel Telford Taylor. And my earnest desire is to avoid repetition as far as I possibly can. And if, uh, uh, may I say, I, I, I welcome any suggestions as I travel the road which the tribunal have to make to make my presentation still shorter. There is a substantial document book, document book number seven, which is a joint document book dealing with both the defendants. Practically all the documents in that book have already been referred to. They nearly all, of course, have a German origin. I only propose to read passages from nine new documents. And those nine documents, I think, are flagged in your Lordship's bundle and in the bundles of your colleagues. May I commence by referring as shortly as may be to the part of the indictment which deals with the two defendants. That will be found on page 33 of the English translation. It begins with Keitel in the middle of the, the page. And it says to defendant Keitel, between 1938 and 1945, was the holder of various offices. I only just want to point out there that although the commencing date is 19. 38, the prosecution rely on certain activities of the defendant Keitel <coughs> before 1938, and we submit that we are entitled so to do because of the general words appearing on page 28 of the indictment at the head of the appendix.
the statements herein after set forth, following the name of each individual defendant, constitute matters upon which the prosecution will rely inter alia as establishing their responsibility. <coughs> and then uh, the tribunal will see Keitel used the foregoing position, his personal influence and his intimate connection with the Führer in such a manner that he promoted the preparations for the wars in count one, if I may read it shortly. He participated in the planning and preparation for wars of aggression and in violation of treaties. He executed and, and uh, executed the plans for wars of aggression and wars in violation of treaties. And he authorized and participated in war crimes and crimes against humanity. Then the defendant Yodel between 1932 and 1945 was the holder of various positions. He used the foregoing positions, his personal influence and his close connection with the Führer in such a manner, and this is not to be found in the particulars relating to Keitel, he promoted the accession to power of the Nazi conspirators and the consolidation of their control over Germany. And uh, may I say, my lords, here that I know of no evidence at the moment to support that allegation that he promoted the Nazi rise to power before 1933. There is plenty of evidence that he was a, a devoted, almost a fanatical admirer of the Führer, but that, I apprehend, would not be enough. And then it is alleged against Yodel that he promoted the preparations for war, he participated in the planning and <coughs> preparation of the war <coughs> and that he authorized and participated in the war crimes and the crimes against humanity. <coughs> My lords, with regard to the position of the defendant Kaifu, it is well known that in February of 1938 he became chief of the OKW, the supreme command of the, all the armed forces, and that Yodel became chief of the operation staff. And that is copiously proved in the shorthand notes and on the document. Perhaps I ought to refer to his position in 1935 at the time when the reoccupation of the Rhineland was first envisaged. Keitel was head of the Wehrmachtsamt in the Reich's war ministry and that is proved by a document 3019 PS which is to be found in Das Archiv and I ask the court to take judicial notice of that it is not in the bundle
Yodel's, Yodel's position were, have been proved by his own statement, which is 2865 PS, which is also US 16. And in 19, 1935, he held the rank of Lieutenant Colonel, Chief of the Operations Department of the Landesverteidigung. Now, may I just refer, in the pre-1938, that's the pre-OKW period, to two documents, one of which is new. The first document I desire to mention without reading is EC 177. I don't want to read it. It's US 390. My lords, those are the minutes shortly after the Nazi rise to power of the Reich's defense working, uh, of the working committee of the delegates for Reich's defense. The date is the 22nd of May, 1933, Keitel presides at that meeting. The minutes have been read. There is a long discussion as to the preliminary steps, the need for secrecy. Documents must not be lost, oral statements can be denied at Geneva. And I submit, if I may be allowed to make this short comment, it is interesting to see in those very early days, 1933, that the heads of the armed forces of Germany contemplated using lying as a weapon. My Lord, the next document I desire to refer to is a new one, and it is EC 405. I desire to refer to this shortly because in my submission it fixes Yodel with knowledge and complicity of the plan to reoccupy the Rhineland contrary to the Versailles Treaty. The tribunal will see that these are the minutes of the Working Committee of the Reich Defense Council dated the 26th of June, 1935. EC 405. And the court will see that a quarter way down the page, sub uh, paragraph F, Lieutenant Colonel Yodel gives a dissertation on mobilization preparation. And it is only the fourth and fifth paragraph that I desire to read on that same page. The last paragraph but one from the bottom. The demilitarized zone 
requires special treatment. In his speech of the 21st of May and other utterances, the Führer has stated that the stipulations of the Versailles Treaty and the Locarno Pact regarding the demilitarized zone are being observed. To the aid memoir of the French Chargé d'Affaires on recruiting offices in the demilitarized zone, the Reich government has replied that neither civilian recruiting authorities nor other offices in the demilitarized zone have been entrusted with mobilization tasks such as the raising, equipping and arming of any kind of formations for the event for the event of war or in preparation therefore. Since political entanglements abroad must be avoided at present, I stress the at present, under all circumstances, only those preparatory measures that are urgently necessary may be carried out. The existence of such preparation or the intention of them must be kept in strictest secrecy in the zone itself as well as in the rest of the Reich. Lord, I needn't read more. I submit that fixes Yodel clearly with knowledge of the forthcoming breach of Versailles. <coughs> My Lord, the day before the Rhineland was reoccupied, on the 7th of March, 1936, the defendant Keitel issues the directive which has been read before C-194, U.S. 55, <coughs> ordering an air reconnaissance and certain U-boat movements in case any other nation attempted to interfere with that reoccupation. My lords, I pass now to the 4th of February, 1938, when the OKW was formed. My lords, shortly after its formation, there was issued a handbook which is a new exhibit from which I want to read short passages. The number of the exhibit is 211. It's, I'm much obliged, it's GB 161. L, 211. L, my lord, 211. And you should find the flag right at the end of the, nearly at the end of the book. Now, this is dated 19438. Top secret for commanders only. Direction of war as a problem of organization. Uh, I only read from the appendix which is entitled, What is the War of the Future? And if the court will kindly turn over 
to the second page, I'm going to read 12 lines from the bottom of the page, beginning a line beginning surprise. Surprise, which must be the premise for quick initial success, will often require hostilities to begin before mobilization has been completed or the armies are fully in position. A declaration of war is no longer necessarily the first step at the start of a war. The normal rules of war towards neutral nations may be considered to apply only on the basis of whether the operation of these rules will create greater advantages or disadvantages for the warring nations. It may, of course, be said that those were only theoretical words and they might apply to any other nation who might be minded to make war on Germany. The court can use its judicial notice of the conditions of things in Europe in 1938 and ask itself whether Germany had any potential aggressors against her. But, my lord, I emphasize that passage because I submit it so clearly envisages exactly the way in which Germany did make war in 1939 and in the subsequent years. My Lord, I now start to tread thank you, the road which has been trodden so many times and which will be trodden so many times again, the road from 1938 to 1941 final act of aggression. Lord, I believe that I can take this so far as Keitel and Yodel are concerned in a very few sentences because I submit that the documents which are already in, which have been read and reread into the record, demonstrate quite clearly that Keitel, as would only be expected, he being chief of the supreme command of all the armed forces, and Yodel, as only would be expected also, he being chief of the operations staff, were vitally and intimately concerned with every single act of aggression which took place successively against the various <coughs> victims of Nazi aggression. And, my lord, I... Uh, your lordships have in front uh, of you the document book and perhaps I know not the trial brief in which those documents are set out under heading, but if I might take first the aggression against Austria, <coughs> your lordship will remember Yodel's diary on the 12th of February 1938, how Keitel who was something more than a mere soldier, put heavy pressure upon Shushni, that is 1780 PS, Yodel's diary, how that on the following day, 
Keitel writes to Hitler, 1775 PS, USA 75, suggests the shamming military action. and the spreading of false but quite credible news, as it has been translated. Uh, then the actual operation orders for Operation Otto, US 74, 75, and 77 all of the 11th of March, 1938, are OKW orders for which Keitel is responsible. Uh, what are the numbers of them? Uh, my Lord, C-102, C-103, and C-182. Yeah. Uh, one of them is actually signed by or initialed by Keitel, and two are initialed by Jodl. Those are the operation orders for the advance into Austria, the injunction the tribunal remembers to treat Czech soldiers as hostile and to treat the Italians as friends. Although well, that's the first milestone on the road the occupation of Austria. My Lord, the second is, is it not the... Well, perhaps if you're going to uh, pass to another... Yes, we'd better adjourn now until two o'clock. Two o'clock. May it please the tribunal. I had got to the commencement of the alleged aggression against Czechoslovakia. And the tribunal will remember that the leading exhibit on that matter is the file 388 PS, US 26, the foul Grun file. My Lords, that file, in my submission, contains copious evidence against both Keitel and Yodel, showing that they were taking the natural part of the chief of the supreme command of the armed forces, and the head of the operation staff. May I remind the tribunal of I item two. I don't want to read any of these. I might just refer to them, which is notes of a meeting on the 21st of April, 1938. And the important thing to notice is that Keitel and the Führer met alone, showing the intimate connection between Keitel and the Führer. And it was at that meeting that preliminary plans were discussed, including the possibility of an incident namely the murder of the German ambassador at Prague. Item five in that file, dated the 20th of May, 1938, show the plans for the political and the military campaign against Czechoslovakia issued by 
Keitel. Item 11, dated the 30th of May, 1938, is the directive signed by Keitel for the invasion of Czechoslovakia with the date given as the 1st of October, 1938. There are many items which are initialed by <coughs> Yodel. Items 14, item 17, to mention only two. Perhaps for the purpose of the note, I should mention the others. <coughs> item 24, 36, and 37. There is the directive, items 31 and 32, dated 27th of September, 1938, signed by Keitel, enclosing orders for secret mobilization. Yodel's diary, 1780 PS, contains many references to the forthcoming aggression, particularly the 30th of May and the 8th of September. And there is a very revealing entry on the 11th of September in Yodel's diary 1780 P.S. in which he says in the afternoon conference with the Secretary of State uh, I beg your Lordship's pardon uh, 11th of September uh, 1938 that is in the afternoon conference with Secretary of State Yanke, from the Ministry of Public Enlightenment and Propaganda on imminent common tasks. The joint preparations for refutation of our own violations of international law and the exploitation of its violations by the enemy were considered particularly important. I emphasize those words, our own violations of international law. And my lords, as a result of that conference, the document C2, which was referred to by my learned leader, Sir David, was prepared, which the tribunal will remember has in parallel columns the possible breach of international law and the excuse which, has, which is then going to be given for it. Been read, it referred to so recently that I needn't refer to it again. And the Lord, I respectfully submit on that branch of the case that there is a, an overwhelming case that Keitel and Yodel played an important 
indeed a vital part in the aggression against Czechoslovakia which led up to the Pact of Munich. Well, not after the Pact of Munich was signed, as has been pointed out many times, the Nazi conspirators at once set about preparations for annexing the remainder of Czechoslovakia. Lord, at this point, Yodel disappears from the scene for a time because he goes to do some regimental soldiering <coughs> as artillery general in Austria, artillery general of the 44th Division. And so it cannot be said that there is e any evidence against him. From the Munich Pact, until the 23rd of August, 1939, when he is recalled on the eve of the Polish invasion to take up his duties once more as chief of the operational staff of OKW. So far as Keitel is concerned, on the 21st of October, 1938, less than a month after the Munich Pact, he countersigns Hitler's order to liquidate the rest of Czechoslovakia and to occupy Memo. The document C-136, U.S. 104. Uh, on the 24th of November, 1938, C-137, GB 33, Keitel issues a memorandum about the surprise occupation of Dancy. Seventeenth of December, nineteen thirty eight, C one thirty eight. U.S. 105, he signs an order to the lower formations, prepare for the liquidation of Czechoslovakia. Those preparations were made. On the 15th of March, 1939, Keitel, who I again re repeat was more than a mere soldier, was present at the midnight conference between the Führer and Harcher, the president of Czechoslovakia, when under a threat of bombing Prague, Harcher surrendered the rest of his country to the Germans. I, I refrain from uh, referring to the contents of that minute which have been read many times already. 
My Lord, so that milestone is past. And again, I submit in all that aggression, it's clear that Keitel was playing a vital part as Hitler's <coughs> right-hand man commanding all the armed forces under him. I now pass to the <coughs> Polish aggression. Keitel was present at the meeting at the Chancellery on the 23rd of May, 1939, L79, US 27, <coughs> when it was said, quoting just a few words, so familiar, Danzig was not the subject of the dispute, <coughs> Poland was to be attacked at the first suitable opportunity, Dutch and Belgian air bases must be occupied. Declarations of neutrality took where to be ignored. The directive for foul vice, the invasion of Poland, is C. 120A GB 41 the date is the 3rd of April 1939 the tribunal will remember the plans were to be submitted to OKW by the 1st of May and the forces were to be ready for invasion by the 1st of September. And that directive is signed by Keitel. Uh, C-126, <coughs> GB-45, is a follow-up of that previous directive. It's dated the 22nd of June, 1939. The need for camouflage is emphasized. And it is stated, don't disquiet the population. That is signed by Keitel. On the 17th of August, 1939, 795PS, GB54, <coughs> Keitel has a conference with Admiral Canaris about the supplying Polish uniforms to Heydrich. And it will be noticed in that last, in the last paragraph of the note that <coughs> Admiral Canaris is against the war and Keitel argues in favor of it. And Keitel made the prophesy that Great Britain would not enter the war. I submit that Keitel's vital part again <coughs> in the preparation for the aggression of Poland is clearly established beyond possibility of dispute. Yodel, as I have said to the tribunal, was recalled on the 23rd of August, see his diary entry, 178 PS, where he says that he's recalled to the 
take charge of the Operation Star. He, he says, seven, 1780 PS, received <coughs> order from Armed Forces High Command to proceed to Berlin and take over position of Chief of Armed Forces Executive Office. And then 1100 hours to 1330 hours, discussion with Chief of Armed Forces High Command. X day has been announced for the 26th of August. Y time has been announced for naught 4.30 hours. And I submit that the tribunal can infer <coughs> the importance of Yodel to this conspiracy from the fact that on the <coughs> eve of the war, he is recalled to, to Berlin to take his place at the head of the operational staff of the Supreme Command. So Poland was invaded, and before I pass to the next aggression, may I just point out that according to the evidence of General Lahausen, if the tribunal accepts it on this point, Keitel and Yodo were in the field with Hitler on the 10th of September, 1939. That's a shorthand note, page 617 and 18. I don't suppose there will be any dispute that the head of the high command and his chief of his operational staff were in the field. Well, Lord, I pass now to Norway and Denmark. Uh, so far as both are concerned, we see from C-64, <laughs> GB-86, that on the 12th of December, 1939, <coughs> Keitel and Yodel were both present at Hitler's conference with Raider when the invasion of Norway was discussed. And Keitel's direct responsibility for those operations is shown in my submission by C-63, GB-87, in which Keitel says that he, the operations against Norway will be under my direct and personal guidance. and he sets up a planning staff of OKW for the carrying out of those operations. <coughs> Yodel's uh, knowledge and complicity in my submission is clearly shown also from the entries in his own diary, 1809 PS. That's the second part of his diary. <coughs> and the tribunal will remember the entry of the 13th of March, 
1940, in which he records that the Führer was still looking for an excuse for the Weser operation. That's the 13th of March. 13th, my lord. Hmm? Uh, 1809, P.S. Yes. The date I've got is the third, doesn't it? I can't hear. <coughs> it's, it's page 5. Page five of that actual exhibit, 13th of March, according to my copy. Oh, yes, I see, yes. Führer does not give order yet for Weser. He is still looking for an excuse. And then in the 14th of March, Führer has not yet decided what reason to give for Weser exercise which in my submission, if I may be allowed to make a short comment, it shows up in a lurid light the code of honor of the military leaders of Germany, still looking for an excuse. The Lord, so far as, and then as we know, Norway was attacked <coughs> unawares, and then subsequently lying excuses were given. Well, Lord, the, <coughs> the invasion of the Low Countries and Luxembourg equally, in my submission, uh, is clearly shown by the documents to have been controlled and directed by Keitel with Yodel's assistance. The tribunal already have a note of the conference in May, Belgium and Holland to be occupied, <coughs> L79. By C62, GB 106, there is a directive signed Hitler on the 9th of October 1939, and another directive signed Keitel on the 15th of October. What letter? 362. Uh, C, my lord. C. C62. It was C62, I think. C, my lord. Yeah. Uh, which comprises two documents, 9th of October and 15th of October, two directives, one signed Hitler and one signed Keitel, both giving orders for the occupation of Holland and Belgium. <coughs> My Lord, C10, GB 108, 28th of November, are Keitel's operation orders for the 7th Parachute Division to make an airborne landing in The Hague, in the middle of The Hague. Four forty PS GB one hundred and seven, dated the twentieth of November, nineteen thirty nine. Signed Keitel. A further directive for the invasion of Holland and Belgium. C seventy two. GB 109, 7th of November, 
1939 to 10th of May 1940, 18 letters, 11 signed by Keitel, 7 signed by Yodel, the Führer is postponing a day because of the weather. <coughs> Lord Keitel's diary is uh, Yodel's diary, I, I, beg, I beg the court's pardon, is also <coughs> eloquent on that subject, that is 1809 P.S. Several entries, perhaps I need not refer to again, relating to these forthcoming operations, culminating with the one on the 8th of May, which perhaps the tribunal will remember when Yodel says alarming information from Holland and he ex expresses righteous indignation that the wicked Dutchman should erect roadblocks and take mobilization particular, uh, uh, mobilization <coughs> preparation. <coughs> My Lord, and so those three neutral countries were invaded and I submit there is copious and overwhelming evidence. These two men were in charge of the military organizations which made those invasions possible. My Lord, I pass now to the planning for the aggression against Greece and Yugoslavia. <coughs> PS 1541, GB 117, <coughs> dated 13th December 1940, Hitler's order for Marita, the operation against Greece, signed by Hitler and copy to Keitel, namely OKW. 4.48 PS, GB 118, 11th of January 1941, Keitel initials a Hitler order for the Greek operation. C-134, <coughs> GB-119, 20th of January 1941, both Keitel and Yodel are present at a conference with Hitler, Mussolini, and others when the operations against Greece and Yugoslavia are discussed. <coughs> C-59, GB-121, 19th February 1941, the dates of the operations against Marita are filled in by Keitel. Seventeen forty six PS GB one hundred and twenty. 27th of March 1941, a conference 
with Hitler, Keitel and Yodel present, the, the decision to a attack and destroy Yugoslavia is announced, and the Fuhrer said, I am determined to destroy Yugoslavia. I shall use unmerciful harshness to frighten other neutrals. And these two soldiers were present when that was said. Uh, my Lord, I submit that on that, the complicity of these two men for that aggression is amply proved. <coughs> my Lord, I pass to Barbarossa. 446 PS, USA 131. Dated 18th of December, 1940, Hitler's order for the Barbarossa operation, initialed by Keitel and Jodl. Hitler says, the tribunal will remember that he intends to overthrow Russia in a, in a single rapid campaign. 872 PS, US 134, 3rd of February 1941, a discussion with Hitler, Keitel and Jodl, Re Barbarossa and Sonnenblumer, a North African suggestion. And Hitler said, when Barbarossa commences, the world will hold its breath and make no comment. I shan't put him there from there. Then 447 PS, USA 135, dated 13th of March, 1941. That is an operation order signed by Keitel. We, the administration of the areas which were to be occupied. Showing again that Keitel was more than a mere soldier. This is civil administration. <coughs> uh, C-39, USA-138, 6 of June, 1941, the timetable for Barbarossa, signed by Keitel, and Yodel gets a six copy. C-78, USA 139, 9th of June 1941, is Hitler's order to Keitel and Jodl to attend the pre-Barbarossa conference on the 14th of June 1941, eight days before the operation. My Lord, uh, on those facts and documents, and on the position of these two defendants, again, I respectfully submit that their participation in this aggression is overwhelmingly proved. My Lord, the last aggression is with regard to the provoked the provocation of or persuasion of Japan to commit aggression against the United States of America. My Lord, there are two key documents and both Keitel and Yodel are implicated by both of them. My Lord, the first is C-75 US-151, dated 5th of March 1941. It's an OKW order signed by Keitel, copy to Yodel, Japan must be drawn actively into the war, is a quotation from it. C-152, GB-122, 18th of March, 1941, 
the meeting between Hitler, Raider, Keitel and Yodel, Japan to seize Singapore. That is the, the relevant extract from there. Lord, on those, those acts of aggression and those preparations for aggression, I submit that the case against these two men is overwhelming. It is clear in my submission that there could be no defense open to them except that they were obeying the orders of a superior. That defense is not open to them on this charter. No doubt, many of, no doubt all these wicked schemes ingerminated in the wicked brain of Hitler. But he could not carry them out alone. He wanted men nearly as wicked and nearly as unscrupulous as himself. My Lord, I now pass very rapidly to the question of war crimes and crimes against humanity. My Lord, it has already been proved that Keitel signed the Nacht and Nabel uh, decrees committing uh, persons to incarceration in Germany where all trace of them was lost. My Lord, that is L90 US 503. There is one fresh document that I desire to put in. Colonel Telford Taylor put in C50, Keitel's order as to ruthless action uh, in the Barbarossa campaign. Lord, there is one complementary document to that. That is C51 which your lordships will find flat. Much obliged to you. Lord, I offer this as GB 162. Lord, this is Keitel's order. Dated the 27th of July, 1941. In accordance with a regulation concerning cl classified material, the following officers will destroy all copies of the Führer's decree of the 13th of May. Lord, that is C C50, the uh, Barbarossa decree. <coughs> in the in the communication mentioned above, A all offices upwards to the rank of general command. Well, Lord, that means that corps commanders downwards to destroy copies. Group commands of armored troops, that again means uh, officers of the armored corps below the rank of corps commanders to destroy. Army commands and officers of equal rank if there is an inevitable danger that they might fall into the hands of unauthorized persons. That means to say that even higher generals, if the war approaches closely to them, should destroy these documents rather than the, the, there should be any chance of it being captured. The validity of the decree is not affected by the destruction of the copy. In accordance with paragraph three, it remains a personal responsibility to see to it that the officers and legal advisers are instructed in time. But only these sentences are confirmed which correspond to the political intentions of the high command. That was with regard to German soldiers not being tried by court-martial for offenses against Soviet troops or citizens. This order will be destroyed together with the copies of the Fuhrer's decree. My Lord, I submit that the 
anxiety on the part of the OKW, presided over by Kuyper, to destroy that, what I suggest was a, an illegal order, a barbarous order, that uh, anxiety is significant. My Lord, I desire now to put in another document which is almost the last document in the bundle. UK 20. What's the number of it? UK 20, my Lord. Your Lordship will find it flagged right at the end of the bundle. United King, UK 20. Oh, yes, I see. He hasn't got another number. It's from the Führer's headquarters, 26 of May, 1943. It says, reference, treatment of supporters of de Gaulle who fight for the Russians. French airmen serving in the Soviet forces have been shot down on the Eastern Front for the first time. The Führer has ordered that employment of French troops in the Soviet forces is to be counteracted by the strongest means. It is ordered supporters of de Gaulle who are taken prisoner on the Eastern Front will be handed to the French government for proceedings in accordance with OKW order so and so. And then I read paragraph three. Detailed investigations are to be made in appropriate cases against relatives of Frenchmen who fight for the Russians if these relatives are resident in occupied France. The investigations reveal that relatives have given assistance to facilitate escape from France, then severe measures are to be taken. <coughs> Lord, I offer that as GB 163. My Lord, there is a document which I feel that I should put in is the next document in the bundle, which is UK 57, GB 164. This is the last document, I think, in the bundle. Oh Lord, it's from the Ausland Abwehr, I believe is the foreign, the intelligence foreign department. It's to the OKW. And it's signed the 4th of January, 1944. Lord, the heading is Re-Counter-Action to the Kharkov Show Trial. <coughs> Paragraph 2 is all that I read. The documents refer to commandos have been collected by the Reich Security Headquarters and thoroughly investigated. In five cases, members of the British Armed Forces have been arrested as participants. In accordance with the orders of the Führer, they were th thereupon shot. The possibility would exist that breaches of international law could not be attributed to them and they could be posthumously sentenced to death by way of the court. Up to the present, no breaches of international law can be proved against the con commando participants. My Lord, I read no more. I submit that that is clearly an admission of murder, not warfare at all. My Lord, Keitel's comments are to be found in the top left-hand corner of that document. We want documents on the basis of which we can institute similar proceedings. They are reprisals which have no connection with battle actions. Then the translation says legal indications are superfluous. 
Lord, in fact, that word, I'm told the German word is justification. Legal justifications are superfluous. I think the original has been handed in, has it not? Perhaps that would be checked by one of the court translators. I'm told that indications is wrong and justification. Is that note at the top signed by which note? It's typewritten in the office copy, which is the original. But <coughs> there's no actual signature. No. Uh, hand it, will you? I'll connect with title there. Chief. Uh, Chief, I'm not written. Wehrmark Chief uh, OKW, that's a note by the Chief of the OKW. And the, the, the uh, German word is Rechtsfertigungen, which I'm told is justification and not indication. Rechtsfertigungen. Now that's the first minute. My Lord, the second minute it's on the same subject, and it's dated the 6th of January, 1944. And there is a large red Keitel K initial on the top of this letter showing that he got it. Lord, the first paragraph deals with two officers who were then at Eichstätt camp in Bavaria. Lord, there is no importance in that paragraph because those two officers are still alive. The second paragraph, attempted attack on the battleship Tirpitz at the end of October 1942. A British well, commander... I the we are dealing with now. I was dealing with the very next page. Um, on the same document. The end of October 42? Yes, yes very well. A British commando that had come to Norway in a cutter had orders to carry out an attack on the battleship Tirpitz in Drontian Fjord by means of a two-man torpedo. The action failed since both torpedoes which were attached to the cutter were lost in the stormy sea. From amongst the crew, consisting of six Englishmen and four Norwegians, a party of three Englishmen and two Norwegians were challenged on the Swedish border. However, only the British seaman, Robert Paul Evans, born London, could be arrested. The others escaped into Sweden. Evans had a pistol pouch in his possession such as are used to carry weapons under the armpit and also a knuckle duster. Violence representing a breach of international law could not be proved. He's made extensive statements about the operation. In accordance with the Führer's order, he was shot on the 19th of January. That should be 43. The original says 43. Copy is wrong. Not again, I submit... That is murder. Violence representing a breach of international law could not be proved. Lord, then the third paragraph. Blowing up of the Glomfjord power station. On the 16th of September 1942, ten Englishmen and two Norwegians landed on the Norwegian coast, dressed in the uniform of the British Mountain Rifle Regiment heavily armed and equipped with explosives of every description. After negotiating difficult mountain country, they blew up important installations in the power station Glomfjord on the 21st September 42. The German sentry was shot dead on that occasion. Norwegian workmen were threatened that they would be chloroformed should they resist. For this purpose, the Englishmen were equipped with morphia syringes. Several of the participants have been arrested while the others escaped into Sweden. Those arrested are Captain Black, Captain Houghton, Top Sergeant Smith, Corporal William Chudley, born at Exeter, 
Rifleman Makem, born at Ipswich. Cyril, Rifleman Cyril Abraham, born in London. Rifleman Curtis, born in London. They were shot on the 30th of October, 1942. Again, there's no suggestion there was any breach of international law. The tribunal will see they were in uniform. And then, paragraph four, Sabotage attack against the German ships off Bordeaux. On the 12th December 1942, a number of valuable German ships off Bordeaux were seriously damaged by explosives below the water level. The adhesive mines had been fixed by five English sabotage gangs working from canoe. From amongst the ten participants, the following, following were arrested after a few days. And then there follow six names, six British uh, names, one an Irishman. Uh, a, a, a lieutenant, a petty officer, a sergeant, and three Marines. A seventh soldier was found drowned. The remainder escaped into Spain. <coughs> Participants proceeded in pairs from a submarine in canoes upstream into the mouth of the River Gironde. They were wearing olive gray special uniforms. After effecting the explosions, they sank the boats and attempted to escape into Spain in civilian clothes and with the assistance of the French civil population. No special criminal actions during the flight have been discovered. All the arrested, in accordance with orders, were shot on the 23rd of March, 1943. Keitel initials that document. The document read by my learned leader, Sir David, not so very long ago, 7.35 PS, Quoted Keitel as saying, I am against legal procedure. It doesn't work out. If your lordship pleases. I was trying to, to uh, cut where I could. Uh, page five, Führer's headquarters, 9th of January, 1944. The Chief OKW has handed the Deputy Chief, that ought to be WFST, that's Yodel, the enclosed letter with the following remark. Hmm? Valimore, I'm sorry. It is of no importance to prove breaches of international law in documentary fashion. What is important, however, is the collection of material which can be used for presentation of a show trial from a propaganda point of view. A show trial as such is therefore not meant to take place, but merely a propaganda presentation of cases of breaches of international law by enemy soldiers who will be mentioned by name and who have already either been punished with death for their crimes or are awaiting the death penalty. Chief OKW asked the Chief of the Foreign, De Foreign Department, that's Admiral Canaris, to bring with him corresponding documents for his next visit to the Führer's headquarters. As the Tribunal heard from my learned friend Sir David, when he read 7.35 PS earlier today, Keitel said, I am against legal procedure. It doesn't work out. One can agree with Keitel, having read that record what, of what in my submission is cold-blooded murder of brave men, brave soldiers and sailors who were fighting for their country. And although this trial has the records of many millions, of death and violent death. I submit there are few records, the death of brave men, the murder of brave men, which are more poignant 
then the document to which I have just referred. My Lord, I have finished my presentation of the case against uh, Keitel and against Yodel. So far as Yodel's part in the war crimes and crimes against humanity is concerned, uh, he figures much less than Keitel. Of course, he had no power of giving orders or directives. But we see that he, at any rate, he signs and circulates the infamous order of uh, the Führer saying that commandos and so on are to be shot, are not to be treated as prisoners of war at all. Lord, in my submission, the evidence against these two men is overwhelming and their conviction is demanded by the civilized world.